Hi, I'm Eric Slokowski, a member of the Von Braun Astronomical Society and the Astronomy Day Coordinator for 2020. This year, our theme for Astronomy Day is how to be an amateur astronomer. So I think it's very appropriate to begin with a presentation to set the stage for today's events. My talk will first cover some of our history. Who were these amateur astronomers and how did they come to build this organization and facility that we call VBAS? Second, what was it that motivated them? Why were they fascinated with the heavens? Lastly, I'll give a very broad overview of the hobby of amateur astronomy that we at VBAS have enjoyed for doing for 66 years. Throughout the remainder of Astronomy Day, VBAS members will go into more detail on how you too can become an amateur astronomer or expand your knowledge and skills as an amateur astronomer. So I hope you'll stay with us and enjoy these presentations, discussions, and observing sessions. Now let's get started. Imagine yourself here at the VBAS facility in Montestano State Park, Huntsville, Alabama. Even though you're only in VBAS in a virtual sense, in reality, in the big scheme of things, you are also here and here. When we step back from the daily routine and we remember what is up there in the night sky, we get a whole different perspective on our place in the grand scheme of things. This knowledge that there is more out there is what motivates amateur astronomers, and this is what motivated the founders of our society. Our Huntsville story begins during the darkest days of World War II. In 1941, Redstone Arsenal is founded as a chemical weapons production center to fight against Nazi Germany, which had overrun most of Europe. Meanwhile, in Germany, a team of scientists and engineers perfected the ability to launch heavy payloads on large liquid-fueled rockets, the deadly V-2. No one present during the Redstone Arsenal founding could have imagined that only nine years later, in 1950, some of those same German scientists, having been captured and converted to the cause of freedom, would take up residence in Huntsville. Huntsville's Redstone Arsenal was selected as the location for rocket development because of its abundance of vacant space post-war and its great transportation for rocket materials and rockets via the Tennessee River Road and Rail. Today we see United Launch Alliance and Decatur ship large rockets to the Kennedy Space Center starting on the Tennessee River. The rocket team made rapid progress advancing towards larger and ever more powerful rockets. In 1960, the team would become part of the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, or NASA, which was created in 1958. Dr. Von Braun, head of the now Marshall Space Flight Center, seated on a table in the photograph, became America's spokesperson for the exploration of space, explaining his ideas in magazines and on television. Yet long before his prominence as a national and international celebrity during the Apollo era, Von Braun was thinking about how to get people excited about space and about science. Werner Von Braun had long been interested in astronomy. When he was 13 years old, he got his first telescope as a gift on the occasion of his confirmation in the Lutheran Church. At the age of 16, he convinced his school principal to let him and his classmates build an observatory, which they did, laying the concrete foundation and building the wooden structures themselves. Von Braun said, my interest in astronomy actually preceded my interest in rocketry. In fact, the former triggered the latter. Von Braun's interest in observational astronomy was rekindled in 1954 when Huntsville High School student Sam Pruitt wrote him a letter asking how to start an astronomy club. Von Braun jumped on board with Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger. They held a series of informal meetings at the home of Dr. Martin Schilling, another Redstone Arsenal rocketeer. During the winter of 1954 and early spring of 55. In Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger's book on Von Braun, he relates the story of how Von Braun immediately pushed for obtaining a telescope and building an observatory. In fact, they identified Wilhelm Angela, a guidance and control engineer, to be the perfect man to do the job. Turns out, Angela was sleeping in bed at the time, and Von Bong called his house, insisted on talking to him, and bade him to put on his shirt and pants and come right over to the meeting. 
which he did. Anglo loved the idea and got right to work on designing the building. With the idea of an observatory to drive them, they then focused on organizing and putting their plans in motion. In April 4, 1955, Von Braun was elected president of the Still Informal Club. The Rocket City Astronomical Association was officially born in December 1955. After scouting a site in Montesano State Park, they were able to lease the 13 and a half acre parcel of land for only one dollar. It was only many years later, after Von Braun had moved to Alexandria, Virginia, to become Deputy Associated Administrator for Planning at NASA Headquarters, that the Society asked and received his permission to name itself the Von Braun Astronomical Society, or VBAS, in his honor. As soon as the land was theirs, members eagerly began to prepare the site for construction. Von Braun, Stuhlinger, and Conrad Swanson were among the most active workers. You can see they did all the work themselves, sometimes with the help of a crane from the arsenal. Work crews gathered every Wednesday evening and on many weekends. Many local businesses donated materials and funds. Although the observatory construction began in April of 1956, it was sufficiently advanced by September to permit observation of the direct opposition of Mars on September 6th with the 16 and a half inch telescope Von Braun was able to purchase. Von Braun was a frequent user of the telescope, which for him meant mostly the hours between 1 and 3 a.m. In 1959, when he received word from Germany that his mother had passed away, he drove up to the observatory late at night and spent hours alone scanning the heavens. In 1960, plans were made to upgrade from the 16 and a half inch telescope to a 21 inch telescope, which was completed in 1965. And you see in this photo. A planetarium is a natural companion to the observatory. It's a very useful tool for teaching astronomy and for revealing the wonders of the sky to the public. The building, a 40 by 40 foot butler shell, was furnished on the inside by volunteer VBAS members. The biggest job was to assemble the 33 foot diameter dome at floor level and to hoist it up intact seven feet. The hoisting was done by turning simultaneously 16 nuts on 16 threader rods, and these were bolted to the building's steel roof beams to support the dome in place. The dome, the 33-foot diameter dome, is actually a Saturn V third-stage fuel tank top-half bulkhead test unit that was obtained, obviously, from the Apollo program. The heart of the Ferner von Braun Planetarium is the projector, we currently use Spitz A3P, which allows us to show the stars, the planets, and the ecliptic, which is the path the planets travel through the sky, and several other features of the night sky. During non-COVID times, we hold planetarium shows up on Montesano every Saturday night. At the dawn of the space age, the Rocket City Astronomical Association published a quarterly space journal the first issue, published in the summer of 1957, came out before Sputnik launched in October of that year. The goal was, quote, for the not-so-scientifically-minded man to understand more about science and its ever-increasing effect on man's very existence, unquote. It contained articles by leading space advocates, written for the average person, and it even contained some science fiction. It was a great way to get the word out about what astronomers were discovering and how we might actually visit these places one day. You'll notice some of the striking artwork on most of the covers. Some of the artists influenced Stanley Kubrick and later went on to design the sets on his movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now let's turn to what's getting these fine folks so excited, the heavens. Just what to get excited about. Let me give you a modern overview of I think it's fair to say that most people have heard either in school or from news stories that the universe is big, really big. They've heard that there are stars and planets, there are galaxies, there are even black holes. 
and that the universe is billions of years old. But I also think it's fair to say that most people don't stop to really ponder, to really think about the magnitudes of the numbers. Even those of us who do stop to ponder can't really comprehend the sheer immensity of the universe and the incomprehensibility of deep time. Here are just a few examples to think about. On the right, the map shows a circle 2,000 kilometers in diameter. Let's have that represent our galaxy, the Milky Way. Now note that the Milky Way has somewhere between 200 and 400 billion stars. It's so big that light takes 100,000 years to cross it. That's 100,000 light years. Now consider that if the green circle were our galaxy, then our entire solar system would be the size of a quarter lost somewhere on the side of the road in Nebraska. If you've ever driven across country or even down to the beach, you will have a better feel for just how small, how almost insignificant our entire solar system is on the scale of the galaxy. Now take a look at the figure on the left. Our Milky Way is in the center. Each of the panels is one or more orders of magnitude, factors of 10, smaller or larger. Our local group of about 54 galaxies has a diameter of about 10 million light years. The local group is part of a supercluster. You probably don't know, but our supercluster is called Laniakea. It's a Hawaiian word for open skies or immense heaven. It is over 100,000 galaxies, and it's about 520 million light years across. Above that, there are clusters of superclusters, and the observable universe seems to be about 93 billion light years across and contains at least 2 trillion galaxies. On top of that, the whole thing is 13.8 billion years old, and our sun is 4.8 billion years old. It's truly mind-boggling in scale, but also mind-boggling for all those things that it contains. The range of objects in the heavens is wide. Everything from our familiar terra firma to dwarf planets made of ice, comets, asteroids, our familiar sun, but also blue and red giant stars, red dwarf stars, carbon stars, old stars, and bright new stars. They're incredible groupings of stars and open and globular clusters. Amazing gas clouds forming stars are being blown away from newly formed stars. There are an immense variety of galaxies of all shapes. Scientists have even detected black holes. But not just the objects themselves are varied, but also the physical processes that shape them. Yes, the universe is truly amazing, the stuff of great science books. Yet what I find most amazing is that we don't have to leave the universe to the professionals. We, that is anyone with an interest, can actually witness many of these amazing things with our own eyes. You don't need fancy equipment to be an amateur astronomer. The first step in actually being an amateur astronomer is just paying attention to the sky both day and night. Just paying attention to the sun's position in the sky or shadow throughout the day is amateur astronomy. No equipment needed. Watching the sun's position across the seasons will tell you an awful lot about the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Then there's the moon. We can see a lot of features on the moon with the naked eye. You can watch the rising and setting times of the moon each day and the phases throughout a lunar month. It's very easy to learn the constellations these days with free smartphone applications that allow you to hold the phone up to the sky and know what you're looking at. With a little research, you can learn which of the stars are blue giants and red giants, which will live for billions of years to come, and which, like the red giant supergiant, Betelgeuse, might supernova tonight or sometime in the next 100,000 years. Another fun activity that takes no equipment is meteor watching. Predicted meteor shower dates are well known in advance and available on the internet. All you need to do is go to a place outside town with darker skies, sit back, and enjoy the show. 
Something else you can easily see in dark skies on a clear night is the Milky Way itself. Another awe-inspiring sight is our near neighbor in a local group of galaxies, the Andromeda Galaxy. At 2 million light years away, it's still large enough to be seen with the naked eye. In fact, it's larger than the moon in our sky and amazing that you can actually see something that's 2 million light years away with your naked eye. When you really get the astronomy bug and you want to see even more, you can get some binoculars or a telescope. Here the possibilities span the gamut. Incredible views of the moon that let you see that it's an actual world. Features of the planets, nebulae, hundreds of galaxies. It's all there to be seen with a little patience and practice. That's where the hobby of amateur astronomy comes into play. Like any interest or hobby, you get out of it what you put in. Your level of interest can grow from simple curiosity to a lifelong passion or anything in between. As I said earlier, you don't need to start with lots of equipment. It's very beneficial to learn from others who share your interest to see what's worked for them before you go out and buy a bunch of things. As I said earlier, the hobby of amateur astronomy starts with observing, and that starts with simply noticing the sky and being curious. What are the sun and the moon doing in the sky today? How can you read the cycles of the moon? How can you read the seasons? Can you identify some of the constellations? How about more? What constellations are going to be up tonight, and where are the planets? There's a lot you can notice and follow just from even casual observing. When you're ready for more, find a darker sky, look for the Milky Way, Andromeda. Remember, it takes time for your eyes to adapt to see well in the dark. If you want to be more structured in your observing, there are many great free programs as part of the Astronomical League. All BMAS members are also members of the Astronomical League and can participate in these observing programs. The best thing about observing with the eye is that it's absolutely free. It's always with you and you don't need to carry around any extra weight. But there are some limitations. There's only one magnification. Dark adaptation is also something to consider. It takes up to 30 minutes for your pupils to fully dilate, allowing you to see the faintest naked eye objects. And one look at your cell phones or car headlights will destroy that and set you back again for another 20 to 30 minute wait while your eyes fully adapt. But there is a lot that you can see with just your eyes. The Milky Way, open clusters, the moon, the Orion Nebula. Before we talk about optics, it's important to understand the concept of field of view. Field of view measures how large or small a patch of sky you're viewing. It's measured in degrees, minutes, and seconds of arc, and it's the angle that patch of sky makes with your eye. The moon is about one half a degree on the sky. The Andromeda galaxy is about three times larger than the full moon. Now planets are very small, only seconds of arc. That's one sixtieth of one sixtieth, or one three sixtieth of a degree for each second. So Mars, at its largest in this photo, is only about 1 135 the size of the moon on a sky. That's why you only see a bright dot with your eye. With binoculars, you can see a disk. With a telescope, you could begin to see features. So binoculars are often the best way to get started with optics. They're very versatile for night observing as well as wildlife watching. The numbers on the binoculars, such as 8 by 42, represent the magnification, 8 times bigger than naked eye, and the size of the lens, 42 millimeters. Higher magnification, the first number, means you need steadier hands to hold it up to the sky or use a tripod. Bigger lenses mean heavier, so holding it is harder to keep it steady. 
So it's best to try out a pair and see how well you can hold them before deciding what to buy. A telescope opens up many more possibilities for observing, both for astronomy and for terrestrial observing. The magnification and higher light gathering power allows you to see things that you simply cannot see with naked eyes or binoculars. There are many types available depending on what you want to see and do. Optical and mechanical quality are critically important for an enjoyable experience. A smaller, higher quality telescope is often better than a larger, low quality instrument. As with any hobby, you can find endless opportunities to buy more stuff filters, computers, cables, carrying cases, dew heaters, and you always want that larger, higher quality telescope. You can never have enough accessories. You can even observe during the day, but only with the proper equipment and careful attention to safety protocols. You can get full spectrum solar filters for most telescopes that block all but one thousandth of the incoming light. This allows you to see the disk of the sun and sunspots. With a dedicated and expensive hydrogen alpha telescope, you can see even more detail. VBAS and some of our members actually own some very nice hydrogen alpha telescopes. You can see solar flares, granules, and filaments, structures larger than the earth and spewing out huge amounts of energy. The neat thing about observing the sun is you can see features like flares noticeably change over the course of only 10 minutes. Many amateur astronomers enjoy trying photography at night. This is a great way to capture more than the eye can see. Even something as simple as a nightscape photo at a dark sky location can be very rewarding. Of course, you can use more sophisticated single lens reflex or even mirrorless cameras with guided telescopes for more magnified shots. And once you decide that amateur astronomy is really your thing, you can get a dedicated astronomical camera, or several. In later years, after moving to Alexandria, Virginia, Werner von Braun took many fine astrophoto photo photographs from his backyard observatory using an 8-inch Celestron with piggyback-mounted 6-inch Schmidt camera, and it was a 60th birthday guest from his friends. Amateur astronomy can truly be a lifelong Telescope making can actually be very rewarding as well. The photograph shows a machine built by Wilhelm Angler circa 1960 for flattening the blank for a 21-inch telescope. The man in the photo is Mr. Charles M. Chambers, who worked at Redstone and was instrumental in building our first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1. The person most responsible for grinding the final optical surface on the mirror is Mr. Clarence E. Ellis, who was a life member of VBAS. His daughter, Pat Ellis Vidler, told us her remembrance of this. Quote, Daddy loved the observatory and all that went on there. He and Dr. Angela and Conrad Swanson spent long hours discussing the telescope and astronomy in general. Daddy ground the mirror by hand in our basement, using a candle and a human hair to test the curvature and whatever. It took many months, maybe more than a year. One of my fondest memories is having him pop up from the cellar asking for someone to make coffee. He had smears of red rouge, one of the powders he was used for polishing, on his clothes and streaks on his face. He'd pull a hair, usually from me, because mine was the longest back then, and carry it carefully back down to use in his testing. It was a special time in my life." Unquote. Many of us love to do public outreach when we can. Events like Astronomy Day, Sidewalk Astronomy, Observe the Moon Night are great ways to share your love of amateur astronomy. I cannot begin to tell you how neat it is to help a child or even an older adult see Saturn's rings through a telescope for the first time. It's neat to see the gleam in their eyes when they realize the universe is not contained inside the internet or only visible to trained scientists. It's right there above our heads. As you can see from the previous slides, we have many great resources for amateur astronomy at VBAS. 
from the Werner von Braun Planetarium to the Conrad Swanson Observatory. You may not know that we have one of the best astronomy libraries in the southeast. It's named for Anne Pollard Sanford, who was a longtime member of the society and a great role, role model for all other women, according to the Huntsville Times. She loved nature, the outdoors, and canoeing, and took up amateur astronomy later in life. She also happened to be a librarian who whipped our book collection into shape and cataloged all the volumes, and thus we named our library in her honor. On her passing, her children donated her magnificent Questar three and a half inch telescope, and that was a $4,000 telescope in the 1980s with very high quality optics. We still loan her telescope out for a full year each year to a deserving youth member of the society. Our complete library catalog is available via the internet and our current librarian, Jeff Bennett, will deliver books to members' homes during the pandemic. Speaking of the internet, there are so many great resources available, it's easy to get drawn in for hours. You can even download free great applications for your smartphone that will point out objects in the night sky just by holding it up and pointing it around. But as I said, it's easy to get lost in all the information out there. Perhaps the best thing you can do to learn about amateur astronomy is to talk to someone who's doing it. That's where being involved in a club comes in very handy. VMAS members love to share our hard-earned knowledge. Trying to figure out what you are seeing at night sky, looking for that, through that first pair of binoculars or that first telescope, we can help. Frustrated that what you see in your telescope doesn't look like a 10-hour exposure of a Hubble Space Telescope? We can explain why and whether you are seeing what you think you should be seeing. Trust me, we've already made lots of mistakes, so ask us and we can help you get in to actually enjoying the hobby sooner than you could on your own. So what's your interest in amateur astronomy? History in the Rocket City? Knowing more about the heavens? Or actually taking up the hobby? The great thing about amateur astronomy is you have a lifetime of learning, you can challenge yourself, and you can interact with some very interesting people. So we hope that you'll come up and join us at VBAS once this pandemic is over.